The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The peace of Christ be with you always. up my soul. My God, I put my trust in you. Let me not be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. Let none who look to you be put to shame. Rather, let those be put to shame who are treacherous. Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation, and in you have I trusted all the day long. Remember, O God, your compassion and love, for they are ever from everlasting. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. Remember me according to your steadfast love and for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. You are gracious and upright, O Lord. Therefore, you teach sinners in your way. You lead the lowly in justice and teach the lowly your way. All your paths, O Lord, are steadfast love and faithfulness to those who keep your covenant and your testimonies. We confess that we are caught in snares of sin and cannot break free. We hoard resources while our neighbors are hungry and cold. We speak in ways that silence others. We are silent when we should speak up. We keep score in our hearts. We let hurts grow into hatred. For all these things and for sins only you know. Forgive us, Lord. Amen. Here is a flood of grace. Out of love for the whole world, God draws near to us, breaks every snare of sin, and washes away our wrongs, and restores the promise of life through Jesus Christ. Amen.
you protected your son from sin. Renew us in the gift of baptism. May your holy angels be with us, that the wicked foe may have no power over us. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our scripture reading for today is taken from 1 Peter chapter 3. Christ also suffered for sins once for all the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Be acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 
When my older kids were growing up, we often evoked the powerful and binding pinky swear. This powerful act was meant to keep everyone involved true to their word. If someone's room needed to be cleaned before we went to Chuck E. Cheese, then a pinky swear might be employed. It was a strong course of action, but desperate times called for desperate measures. I advise anyone thinking of using a pinky swear to tread carefully. It is a powerful tool and should not be taken lightly. But in all seriousness, we know the importance of promises. When we make a promise, we need to understand that we are expected to follow through with that promise. To break a promise is more than just not fulfilling our side of an agreement. It is to break trust and relationship. Think of the wedding vows that we make when we are married. We promise our partner that we will be faithful to them in body and in spirit. The person we choose to spend our life with is to be our person, our confidant, our love, the intimate partner of both our body and soul. To stay faithful to that person is to honor them and the love that the two of you have worked to cultivate together. And when that covenant is broken, it breaks a relationship and it breaks the heart of the person who is on the receiving end of that betrayal. We speak of this relationship as the covenant of marriage, and there isn't really a better word to speak of the depth of those promises made to another human being. When there is abuse or infidelity or another irreparable sundering of the relationship, those promises need to be abrogated. But it is always with a heavy heart that those decisions are made. Covenants, whether they are made in marriage or in other facets of life, are extremely important and should never be taken for granted. Thus, the word covenant is used very intentionally in regard to our relationship with God. Covenantal language is used throughout Scripture, and it speaks to the kind of relationship that we are to have with our Creator. Like in a marriage, it is a relationship built on love and the mutual joy of both parties. The covenants throughout the Hebrew Bible were mutual agreements between God and the people. The people were asked to hold to God as their one and only God, to honor the Ten Commandments, to care for the weak and vulnerable amongst them, and to live according to a different set of principles, ones based on community and the opportunity for all to have a place. In turn, God would offer undying love and protection and make of the Israelites a great people. The first covenant we encounter is that of Noah, tasked to preserve life on earth after God decides to bring forth a great flood Noah is later promised by God that God will never take such action against humanity again. The rainbow was put into the sky to honor that covenant. That first covenant reminds us of another covenant, one that many of us have experienced, namely baptism. But where the covenant of Noah was made so water would not again be used to destroy, the covenant of baptism uses water to grant us life namely the life of the Spirit. As Peter says in our epistle reading for today, in bap baptism now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Peter, like Paul, sees that in the waters of our baptism we are not washed clean, so much as we are made new, risen to new life through the work of Jesus Christ. In baptism, we are promised this renewal to new life in the Spirit repeatedly. We are promised God's abiding love forever. We are granted forgiveness and mercy forever. And for our part, our parents took on the promise to help us grow into our Christian faith and become citizens of the world, people who would serve and love to all those around them. When we grow older, those promises became ours to live out. We are asked to continue our journey as followers of Christ, to find a way to stay engaged with this community and with God. Now, biblical covenants seem like a beautiful thing, which they are, but they are also heartbreaking. They are heartbreaking because of how infrequently we seem to live into God's covenant. We always seem to find ways to break or ignore our part of that covenant. And this only leads to difficulty and struggle. I think of the covenant made with Moses and the people, and again with David, and how God honored God's part and the people in time 
went their own way. The result was that the kingdom was eventually broken in two and then lost altogether. They chose to break covenant with God and on their own, they found only pain. Again, is it so different than a marriage covenant? When one person is unfaithful, it usually spells the end of the relationship. It isn't that the wrong partner wants to take revenge on their partner or wants to hurt them in kind. They simply can't trust them anymore. They may even love them still, but they can't be in a relationship without trust, and so everything changes. Life is never the same. What was once is now lost. So it is with our covenant with God. Our infidelity doesn't cause God to punish us or exact revenge, but we have broken trust, as the Israelites did. They pushed away from God, trusting in other gods and their own strength. The result was they fell into ruin. They broke the relationship, and they pay the natural consequences for that choice. But the difference between a covenant of marriage and a covenant with God is that the infidelity that causes so much hurt in both relationships does not end the relationship with God. Does God mourn the hurt we cause God? Yes. Does God give up on us, walking away from us forever? No. God never has. God never will. If God did, then Israel would have vanished away on the sands of time. But they didn't. God still cherished God's relationship with them. And for all the times that we have broken faith, that we have chased other gods, God is still there, waiting for us, never forsaking us, willing to forgive now and every moment of our life. That's the big difference between a covenant with God and a human covenant. Despite all the ways in which we fail to uphold our side of the covenant, God never gives up on us. We are never forsaken by our Creator. In the end, this is nowhere more apparent than through what God accomplished through Christ. We could never hold against the power of sin, so God took its final sting away from us by bearing it for us. God knew we would continue to fall short, and so God changed the rules. The sin that was the great killing weight upon us was removed from us, and we were set free. God loves us that much and holds to God's side of the covenant so absolutely. We are loved, and we are God's children, and God will stop at nothing to fulfill God's side of the covenant, even when we cannot fulfill ours. May we be inspired by such love to follow ever more closely with God. Amen.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in God's promise to reconcile all things, let us pray for the Church, the well-being of creation and the world in need. God, our truth, the ark of your Church, has room for many expressions of faith. We give thanks for voices that challenge and awaken your people. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God, our Maker, you remember our covenant with the earth and its inhabitants. Rescue communities and creatures hurting from natural disasters. Preserve species and habitats endangered by human carelessness and disregard. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of light, you know our weakness. Free all who govern from the temptations of power. Sustain all who work for human rights in every nation. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God, our help you care for our beloved children. Comfort all who are grieving, ill, afraid, in pain, or in despair. Feed hungry people living in food deserts. Protect any at risk from exploitation and abuse. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God, our home, you gather your people. Grant us health and safety as we assemble. Keep us mindful of any who are homebound, hospitalized, convalescing, or traveling. Take a moment now to name those we know of who are in need of such prayer. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God, we pray for this Lenten journey that we are now upon. As we explore the idea of covenant and what it means to be in covenant to you, may we also begin to explore what it means to be in covenant with one another. That it means love, it means reciprocal justice and mercy of forgiveness and of relationship. Help us to trust you. Help us to let you guide us in this covenantal journey we are on. And may it enrich our lives, and may it draw us ever closer to you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God, our hope, you promise eternal life to your beloved children. We remember with gratitude those who have lived and died in faith. Grant that we may also dwell with you in everlasting peace. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Accompany us on our journey, God of grace and receive the prayers of our hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. God in community, holy in one, may we never be apart from you, even as we pray as we are taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
Let us pray. Merciful God, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Receive the blessing. Beloved, we are God's own people, holy, washed, and renewed. God bless you and keep you, shower you with mercy, fill you with courage, and give you peace. Amen. A few announcements for today. Big thank you to all those who were involved in our Shrove Tuesday Pancake Supper. It went really well and was very well attended and a good fundraiser as we keep driving towards our, our flooring uh, goal so that we can replace the flooring here at the church and just uh, make it a safer and more kind of attractive environment here inside the church. Our World Day of Prayer service um, is coming up on March 1st. It's hosted here at Peace at 7 p.m. If anybody's interested, this is an endeavor where a country is being held up each year. Um, each church that are, is part of this, uh, this uh, program or this initiative takes a turn hosting. It's our turn this year. And this is an opportunity for ecumenical worship and prayer for people, women especially, in this world. We have a couple of studies hopefully coming up. I haven't heard a lot of interest, so maybe they aren't coming up. Maybe it's, uh, they're not of terrible interest to people, but we hopefully will run a Bible study reading Luther, sorry, reading Isaiah with Luther, and then a book study, um, which could still happen any time if anybody's interested on um, the book Dancing in the Darkness, Spiritual Lessons for Thriving in Turbulent Times. So again, if there's any interest, let me know. Uh, there may not be. Maybe that's not something that's on everybody's radar right now, and that's okay too. We continue to pray for the families of Violet Brand and Carrie Meyer, who had their funeral services this past weekend, uh, Friday and Saturday. I invite you to keep them in your prayers, as we keep Elsie Tomaszewski in our prayers as well. Finally, we have a number of birthdays. Carter Clark, Richard Gross, Brian Myers, Prima Samuel, so let us say a word for all of them. God of grace and mercy, we lift up before you today Carter, Richard, Brian, and Prema, and ask that you bless them in their week ahead as they celebrate their birthday. May their celebration be filled with the blessing of family and friends, and may their year ahead be filled with the knowledge of your love in all things. May they know that you walk with them always, and that you care for them, that you uphold them, and that you are there with them every step of their life. Thank you for that blessed assurance. May it guard, give them good strength and comfort for the year ahead. And so we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So a blessing on your, as we can begin this Lenten journey over the next 40 days, may it be a good one, one filled with reconnection with God 
and as we prepare again to hear the story of Holy Week and the, and the resurrection. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now. Share your bread. Thanks be to God. <laughs>